Good evening. I'm Brett Baer. Breaking tonight, we will have my exclusive interview with IRS whistleblower and supervisory special agent Gary Shapley about the Hunter Biden investigation in just a moment. We will talk about why he came forward, what he saw and heard, his analysis of the now infamous WhatsApp messages, and his pushback on the Attorney General of the United States. Joining us tonight to talk about the Hunter Biden investigation is Internal Revenue Service Supervisory Agent Gary Shapley. He is one of the whistleblowers who has given information to Congress about the probe into the business dealings of the president's son. Gary, thanks for being here. Thank you, Brett, for having me. Let's just start at the beginning. Um, why are you doing this? Because every taxpayer deserves to be treated fairly and you know, it was my oath of office to, to, to make sure that that happens. And, uh, um, you know, we wouldn't meet our mission as an agency with IRS criminal investigation, and we'd really lose the trust of, of, of the people of the United States if we didn't ensure that everyone was treated fairly. So for the people who say oh, this is, you know, some planted Republican mm -hmm. who's trying to affect, you know, the upcoming election or has some motivation, what do you say to them? Just simply the facts are the facts, and I've, in my past, I've, uh, I've voted for for both D's and R's, and you know politics are irrelevant when I when I'm conducting my job. And what is your job? So I supervise a group of 12 agents right now, and uh, for everything that they do, from case development, case initiation, all the way through prosecution recommendation and enforcement actions, things like that. And I've been doing that um, since 2018. I've been an agent since uh, for 14 years now. The second whistleblower is actually a, a case agent, not named, but you know who that is. Yes, I do. And you, this is done separately. Um, you're, you're two. You're coming forward separately. Yeah, I was in the October 7th meeting and that ended up being my red line. And uh, that's when I decided to come forward. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to put words in, into the other whistleblower's mouth, but, you know, his red line was at a different time and he did so when he thought uh, he needed to. And he was the case agent specifically. That's correct. He developed this case and worked it since 2018. And you in a supervisory role, you uh, were in this October 7th meeting. Let's get there because that's your red line moment. This is a moment in which your, the Delaware U.S. Attorney David Weiss, according to you, had made this disclosure on October 7th, 2022, meeting with top IRS and FBI officials saying what? So I was there and I witnessed this personally. And he started with, he's not the deciding person on whether or not charges are filed or not. Not the deciding person on whether charges are filed with Hunter Biden. That's correct. Who was? So ultimately this, if you follow the path of where the venue leads you, they went to the DC US Attorney's Office in March of 2022. And they presented this case to them. Uh, at the same time of that, at the same time as that was occurring, they requested discovery from the agents, which is a typical step when they're getting ready to charge. Now, I wasn't in those meetings. I asked to be in those meetings, as did the case agent, so we didn't help present to them. But after that occurred, he was no longer looking to charge in that, in that district. So that's earth-shattering news. Um, it's a Biden-appointed D.C. U.S. Attorney, Matthew Graves, would not allow him to charge in his district. So. I didn't learn that fact until October 7th of 2022, so looking back to March of 2022. And that's when David Weiss in October 7th, 2022 said that the DC US Attorney's Office had will not allow us to charge there. And then he added that he would request special, he requested special counsel authority and was denied. In that meeting, I even had him repeat that because I knew how important that fact was and I wanted to make sure I understood it. You were there and you remember it crystal clear in your mind? Not only do I remember it crystal, crystal clear, but I documented it. The email that's an exhibit in the House Ways and Means Committee testimony was when I returned home that evening, I documented it in, a, in an email, and, it, and it's an exhibit. You can look right on there. And I sent that email to two senior executives, one of which was at that meeting, and I said, is this accurate reflection of what occurred during the meeting? And the response was, you covered it all. So there are other things in that uh, uh, email to include that he needed to go to California and he had gone to California 
to request a charge there. And then he even opines that if they decline to allow charges, that he would have to request special counsel authority from the deputy attorney general or attorney general. Speaking of the attorney general, uh, he was asked specifically about this. Mr. Weiss had, in fact, more authority than a special counsel would have. He has complete, he, has, he had and has complete authority, as I said, to bring a case anywhere he wants in his discretion. But you're saying, this, he's saying that wasn't the case. Look, you know, the, I presented the facts to the House Ways and Means Committee, and uh, they're corroborated, and another whistleblower says the same thing. So, um, you know, there is a disparity there, but um, I was there, I remember it, and, and I can vouch for uh, exactly what's written there today is what happened. So, uh, House Ways and Means Committee, uh, this is Congressman Jason Smith. This was a campaign of delay, divulge, and deny. Whistleblowers say reoccurring unjustified delays pervaded the investigation, including an authentic authenticating a WhatsApp message in which Hunter Biden demands payment from Chinese officials, noting that his father is in the room. All true? Yes. I mean, that's your feeling, what he's describing there. Yes, it is. Yes. This WhatsApp message, I mean, it obviously raised the most eyebrows in Washington because it, it seems to go directly to this. Do you know if there was an effort to authenticate that or uh, to make sure that that had been followed? Sure, and that was the reason why that was included in my testimony was because when we received the, the attorney-client filter-reviewed copy of, of information from the search warrant to Apple, which produced that document, we went back to the uh, prosecutors and we requested to take various investigative steps, and they were not supported. Uh, and, that, and when they weren't supported, they said, well, maybe he wasn't co-located with him. So, well, we, we can take investigative steps to, uh, to, to see that. if that happened. Right. And they didn't support anything uh, in relation to that, to that effort. And it's consistent with their ongoing theme of, of, of not allowing us to pursue or ask questions about President Biden, the big guy. So you were clearly prevented. You felt it. You documented it. You knew it. Yeah, that's correct. And, and throughout the investigation, I was documenting uh, various issues as they arose and to include the search warrants that weren't allowed to be done. What happened with that? Between April and June of 2020, we, uh, we drafted an affidavit to execute search warrant in a couple different locations. And the prosecutors at the time stated that probable cause had been achieved. But as we, we moved closer to the election, um, it just seemed like they kept putting it on the back burner and they eventually didn't allow us to do that search warrant, even though the legal requirements to execute that search warrant were met. Transitioning into another uh, search warrant was on a storage unit in Northern Virginia. And during the day of action on December 8th of uh, 2020, we got updated information that said that records were in that location that were, uh, you know, that would be evidence in this uh, particular investigation. And the prosecutors initially were supportive of it and an affidavit was drafted the night of December 8th, 2020 to go forward for approval. Eventually the prosecutors decided they didn't support it. So I called U.S. Attorney David Weiss with my senior executive on the phone and we said you know, we, we needed to execute this search warrant. They, uh, he responded that the prosecutors didn't want to and I asked if in 30 days if that storage unit wasn't accessed and that was the deadline for the document request that was served on that day, then we can execute the search warrant and he agreed to that. And no sooner had gotten off the phone um, with David Weiss had we learned that the prosecutors were informing defense counsel of that storage unit and the evidence that existed there. So it completely ruined our chance to, uh, to access those unfettered. What do you think was the reason for the holdup? Or the, it, usually you would get that right away. It was a warehouse, right? I mean, it's not a personal home. That's correct. I mean, the least intrusive uh, uh, issue is, is a legal standard in search warrants, and, and there's no way, shape, or form you, can, uh, you could ever claim that going into a un, un, uh, a uh, storage unit with no individuals would be somehow uh, intrusive. And you believed what was in there was crucial to the case? Yes, we believe so, And uh, but we'll never know now because we weren't allowed to access it. And just to be clear, the prosecutors told the defense and suddenly 
it wasn't there. Yeah, well, I mean, we never accessed that. We don't know if they ever turned over the documents that were in that location. That happened in interviews as well, um, as far as sharing information before uh, they happened? So in December 8th, 2020, we finally were going over in this investigation after several uh, delays, which of course uh, we were waiting until after the election to, to execute this at the direction of, of, of the prosecutors and U.S. Attorney Weiss on this case. So we eventually did a day of action where we were approaching the subject and, and several other witnesses. We had a plan to, of what, how we were going to approach Hunter Biden that morning and ultimately we found out that the night before um, I was told the FBI headquarters contacted Secret Service and the transition team and told them of the pending action the next day. So ultimately I don't know how it affected uh, uh, the, the witnesses but there was clear opportunity for them to be tipped off before we even approached them. And of the 12 interviews that we attempted, we only received one substantive interview and that was of Rob Walker. And that was a very important interview as the exhibit in the House Ways and Means Committee transcript uh, indicates. The answers that they gave obviously would be prepped and they would not answer like they would have had you, had they not been tipped off. That's possible. In our case, they just refused to be interviewed. And was there any explanation ever given for any of them? No. I mean, we, we were, as investigators, we were finally over and we were finally moving forward and we thought that, that, that we were, we were going to open up a whole new line of, uh, of things that we can do in the investigation after going over. So uh, it, it may have lost a little bit of, uh, of attention because of that. Stand by if you could. More of our interview with one of the whistleblowers in the Hunter Biden investigation after this quick break. I'm not frustrated of, of, about the outcome, right, because that's out of my control. But what I am frustrated about is that we were hindered when we were conducting this investigation.